So what I thought I would do is you heard share a little bit about my founding journey. Um, this is actually frankly about 20 years ago. So I came to the GSP in 2003. And I want to share my story um, really to try and give a behind the scenes look of starting and scaling a business while at the GSB and then kind of what happened later on. So uh, the startup journey is this kind of roller coaster ride from kind of like uh, surprising highs to miserable lows to sleepless nights to lucky breaks. Um, and hopefully it ends up in the, uh, the end in the, the very um, sunny, sunny period. So my story starts in 2003. I moved to, uh, to, from the UK to GSB in 2003. And then, uh, and this is my graduation photo with uh, my co-founder, Sammy. Um, so a little bit of background about the founding connection. So Sammy and I uh, were fast friends. We were both classmates at the GSB. We both were physics uh, undergrads. We both were European. But I think most importantly, we were kind of both really entrepreneurially minded. We'd had some startup experience preschool, and we just really committed to, to figuring out different ideas, working together, and figuring out a, a startup to do together. So we, early on, we started riffing on ideas, um, and we just catch up and discuss various different ideas over time. So I moved from the UK uh, to, to Stanford, and before that, I worked in online travel and had some exposure to that market. And like many of you, I did my first year at Schwab. In the second year, I was, uh, I was tasked to find somewhere to live with uh, my classmates. So six of us got together. And I was kind of amazed at trying to find this information about real estate. Here we were in Silicon Valley, the mecca of technology, all these amazing tools, and Apple, and Google, and everything else. And like, where's this? Where's the website to find information about real estate? This was also the summer when Google went public, and it was 2004. So the idea was really to solve, how do we think about building a vertical search experience for, for real estate, really inspired by Google. In the same way that perhaps you today you're inspired by ChatGPT. This is a kind of, this was a thing of the moment. And in 2004, this Google IPO was a thing of the moment, the kind of technology shift that was inspiring so many different companies. So we set out to build this vertical search engine for real estate, focus on specifically real estate. So this is our V1. Uh, really building this platform to help to find all the information about real estate all across the web. So we raised some seed money while we were at school from angel investors and set about to build this, this service. We hired a couple of engineers out of the computer science department at Stanford. And really the idea was to build a platform where we helped consumers with all this information about the most important financials of your life, which is often buying real estate. So, the first thing to solve is the, the so-called chicken and egg problem. Like, how do you get started? So chicken and egg, are, or the cold star problem in marketplace, is getting enough supply together and getting enough demand together. So the way that we thought about this was to solve the supply problem was really to aggregate via search all the listings across the web, to bring together this comprehensive consumer experience um, and build an amazing product on top of that. And on the demand side, the, the thing we were trying to, to figure out was that there really wasn't a consumer destination for real estate. There wasn't a Zillow at the time, there wasn't a Redfin, there really wasn't any of these consumer destinations. So people were going to Google and typing in, okay, San Francisco homes for sale, Palo Alto homes for rent. So the, the sort of initial growth hack that we focused on was how do, we, how do we just basically be better at SEO? And so that was the original idea to, to do better at SEO because we've raised a small amount of capital, and then really focus on email and engagement and so forth. Uh, and it kind of worked um, really efficiently. We got lots of listings and then lots of uh, emerging consumer demand. But really, before we, we actually wrote any lines of code, we really thought quite intentionally about our culture. As you'll see later on, really helped us incredibly well to, to, build, a, to build an interesting business. So, we thought very intentionally about what kind of culture we wanted to build as an organization. And the way that we thought about it was, what is the culture that we wanted to work in? What is the culture that enabled us to be successful in this very competitive market and hire the people that we wanted to achieve? Wanted to, to 
join the company to make us successful? And then how do we be different? How do we be remarkable? This is like incredibly competitive uh, environment. And so how do we create this remarkable culture? Because we knew we were going to work, whatever, 60, 70, 80 hours a week. We needed to create a culture that we wanted to be in. You know, and the thing with culture, you've heard this from dozens of people, I'm sure, like define your culture, stick it up on the wall, and then, okay, maybe you forget about it. But that's not culture. You, can't, you have to live culture. And so we're very deliberate about not just defining the culture, but how do you create the rituals and programs within the organization to ensure that actually you truly live that culture. And it's not just a bunch of words stuck on the wall. So over time, we created these various different issues, whether that's uh, innovate. OK, how do you create quarterly hackathons, which the team go off and do whatever they want to do, which they think is important? How do we create, um, if we're customer obsessed, that's not just words on a wall. How do we bring the customers into the conversation and truly share the information and get the voice of the customer across the organization? And it kind of helps, just so you know, to have an acronym like IMPACT, something that's memorable. It's easy to have these words, but people forget them. So the more you have um, something like an acronym, the easier it is. So uh, as you guys know at the GSB, um, if you want to manage something, you have to measure it. And we really thought that culture was a key competitive advantage for us. So we, we did something which at the time was quite unusual. We started to think about culture almost like a product. Not only did we define the culture, but we said, OK, how does the culture evolve over time? So we created quarterly surveys where we literally tracked across the employee base, how are we fulfilling on our promise to live up to the values of the culture? So this is, you see, um, the evolution over a couple of quarters. And then we created initiatives like, so how do, we, how do we improve our innovation metric? How do we improve our integrity metric? Just making sure that we created initiatives to help us improve the way that we're acting on that. So here we are, we started, we launched in 2005. In 2007, in Silicon Valley parlance, we were crushing it. Um, we grew our traffic something like 10x year over year. We'd raised a Series A from Axel, a Series B from Sequoia. Like everything was going incredibly well. And we did what many companies do in this environment. We created multiple product lines. We hired a bunch of people. We um, expanded into different strategic initiatives. We were like, OK, we're going to build a huge company. We're doing all the things that we think are necessary to build a huge company. And then all of a sudden, things kind of collapsed. So the, the velocity of growth stalled. Uh, people were frustrated. People were thinking about quitting. Just the whole thing kind of like um, stopped. The whole growth, the whole momentum stopped. And kind of without realizing it, all the success that we'd had over the previous couple of years had led this complacency. We became bloated. We became slow. We became frustrated. As Andy Groves said, success breeds complacency. We kind of believed our own bullshit. We kind of realized that you know, all the good stuff we'd done in the past had actually led us down a path of creating many challenges for ourselves. So it was a humbling time. Um, and the way that we had started, which was in many ways successful, was creating this kind of command and control structure. So when you're a small team, you're trying to find product market fit, what you do is just create this tight group of people where the founders are driving and driving and driving the vision, the execution, figuring out what's going on. It's a very, very tight organization. But we've grown into something like 50 people, and it become slow. It become unmotivating. People are frustrated. You know, the, the my ideas were not the best ideas. And so we really kind of got stuck in this, in this environment. And then what we had to do is we had to change to what we called at the time an organizational slingshot, kind of creating not just a startup, but startups within startups, creating a decentralized structure where individuals were empowered. I was forced to delegate, which was something that at the time I wasn't really doing particularly well. Uh, we had to just decentralize that decision making. And that as founders, we we're focused on strategy, resources, helping on the joins, but we really empowered the talented team around us to execute 
on the initiatives that they needed to do. And I think most importantly for me, I transitioned from being a product manager into being a company manager, making that transition, that leap, which was hard at the time, but necessary for the company to be successful. That transition from being early product manager to company manager is critical. And the, the sort of framework that I thought about to get there was really to optimizing for knowledge across the organization. How do we move really fast? But how do we share knowledge and insight across the organization? When you're like 10 people in a room, communication's pretty easy. But when you get about 50 people, you have to put structures, processes, communication that's, that transcends beyond that initial period. How do you empower teams, obviously? And then how do you, like we said earlier, really program the culture to build something that really scales? So I got through that period. I'd made that transition myself from that product manager to company manager. And then things started really starting to take off again. And we started to scale rapidly the organization and then think about reinforcement. What are other things that we needed to do to build a really defensible business? So if you remember, we started with this search engine, which in retrospect was incredibly fragile. We were going out and scraping information, publishing it. We transitioned that to building partnerships with really the biggest real estate companies uh, in the US, deep relationships with MLSs and brokers and franchisors, all the big companies. We built um, a network effect beyond the original marketplace network effect called the uh, protocol network effect where we created industry standards to bring in data, real-time data to provide a, uh, a really powerful and comprehensive set of information about, about on the platform on real estate. We added a data network effect, which essentially the more data we had from the more users, the more powerful the product experience got. So, and, and I'm sure you guys have kind of studied uh, about network effects, but the raw definition is the more people use a product or service, the better it gets for every other user. So we use that, um, that power and that data from all the users to, to build a recommendation engine and many other things that the more people we have on the platform, the better the service got for everyone else. So a simple recommendation system that powered emails, that powered notifications, that powered the website, to say, if, we, if you like this property, you're going to like these other properties that made our service much better than many of the incumbents. So again, everything was going really well. And this was in 2008. And then again, uh, this happened. So um, the financial collapse of 2008, really driven by the mortgage collapse of the time, meant that uh, home prices uh, collapsed by about a third. Home transactions collapsed by a third. And working for an online, an, a very unprofitable online real estate company was kind of the worst place to be at that time. It was a really tough time. Our customers were going bankrupt. We were burning through cash. It was impossible to raise any more money. And we had to figure it out. Um, and inspired by my fellow Brit, if you're going through hell, um, keep going. It was just a brutal, brutal time um, in real estate back in 2008. And I think I, I look back to, to that period at the beginning where we did that work on the culture, where we defined the culture up front and we really managed the culture. It was that investment then that really enabled us to navigate through that really changing period. And it was the time for the team to really step up and figure out, OK, how do we see ourselves through this period? So the, the core problem that we had was that um, <clears throat> when we we're a small team and we we're focused on making revenue, what we did was to, well, who's got the most money? And it was big banks, big brokers, big franchises also. We had a small team going after these big, um, big companies, like Wells Fargo would give us whatever, $500,000. Caldwell Banker would give us $500,000. But the problem is those companies just didn't see that ROI. They didn't see the, the, the revenue directly to them. And so what we had to do was, was move directly to the transaction. So the contracts with Wells Fargo, they were canceling it. The contracts with the big brokers, they were canceling it. And so we had to move much closer to a, uh, a clearer ROI. So we had to shift from selling to a small number of people doing enterprise sales to big customers essentially completely changed the business model to go after a small, a large number of customers 
selling a modest amount or buying a modest amount from us, which is a complete revenue pivot for us. But those agents, the real estate agents, which were desperate to make sales and they make commissions, were focused on that clear ROI. They pay us a couple of thousand dollars and they could get tens of thousand dollars back in terms of commissions. So this is from our IPO perspective. So you can see back in 2005, 2008, we were almost doubling revenue quarter over quarter. So really rapid growth. And then in the 2008 period for another 18 months, we were essentially flatlining. Um, we, we were just trying to hold on to revenue by adding new revenue from the, 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 the business model change. And then by 2009, 2010, we kind of figured it out and started growing. Um, we became cash flow positive in 2010, which was probably the first time I slept well at night for a couple of years. Um, and then we continued to grow up until 2012. And so we went public, as you heard, in, in 2012. So this is a cute little photo from the, um, from the IPO. And it was, it was strange because we obviously, as a sign of a great milestone, a great success, but we felt the business was incredibly fragile. We'd gone through this period of time where we'd been just like holding on, just trying to break even. There was literally no money available for us to, to, to go through that. We went public having raised $33 million, which I think is a, at least two years ago was a small A round. So, uh, so we raised this 33 million and went public, and it was the financial crisis that gave us this efficiency as a platform, and it was the network effects that gave us this defensibility um, and utility. The more people use the service, the better it got for everyone else. Um, and so it became this, you know, at the time, a, a very um, powerful, fairly dominant marketplace focused on real estate across the US. Um, and the way that we, you know, as you guys know, NFX is all about network effects. The way that we kind of thought about the network effects within the business. So as you heard, we started with this two-sided marketplace, consumers and listings, and then added these other network effects from the protocol network effect to provide data and standardized data across the industry to a data network effect that improved the product experience. And this is from our network effect map to really define how we think about the opportunities the network effect capabilities that really define the defensibility for our business. And the, the reason that we were so excited at NFX about network effects is that if you look back over the last 25 years, um, since really the dawn of the internet, network effects are responsible for over 70% of the value in technology businesses. So um, you think of the big businesses today, whether it's Airbnb, whether it's Uber, whether it's Facebook, whether it's WhatsApp, <laughs> all driven by network effects. And you speak to those founders, and they have a similar story, like we were getting going, it was starting, it felt incredibly fragile. Um, but then you get to a certain scale, and it becomes incredibly defensible, um, incredibly powerful, and almost when it take most or when it take all outcome. So for the next couple of years, we, as a public company, we scaled, um, and we built out this, this really successful and valuable business. And then I got this email um, in uh, June from Rich Barton, who is the founder and CEO of, of Zillow, which was our nemesis, our rival, our chief competitor. Um, and we got to know each other over the years. And so he goes, yeah, Pete, um, would you like to have dinner next week? And um, I mean, we're, we're arch rivals. This is like a big deal. <laughs> like he's not asking me for like a chit chat. So I reply back and, and said, I'm, I'm way too busy, working way too hard, <laughs> no time to eat. And then he, and he sort of insisted. And then, he, and then he called me. I said, Pete, look, I really think we should have dinner. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I said to him literally that um, I'm at the airport. Uh, it's my 40th birthday in uh, next weekend. My wife's organized this big party. I would love to have dinner, but I'm actually going to be in Europe at my 40th birthday party, so I can't make it. Um, uh, which she goes, well, oh shit, because I've got this letter in front of me that's been signed by my board of directors, 
about proposing a merger between Trulia and Zillow. And they were like, oh, shit. So he, he realized he just screwed up my entire um, 40th birthday. Um, suffice to say, we, we, um, I did actually go to, back to the UK uh, for that. Um, I spent the whole time on the phone with the bankers and lawyers and, and navigating it. And we ended up uh, negotiating the deal. It's a really interesting thing where you propose that a merger, a combination. And at the time, Trulia was a multi-billion dollar company, amazing team, amazing job, um, amazing opportunity. And then your kind of closest rival reaches out and says, you're proposing a merger. And my initial reaction at the time was, um, no freaking way. Why would I do that? I've just been, you know, we've been battling together over the years. Um, and after some sort of soul searching, some thinking, you know, obviously I, I changed my mind and, and realized it was the right thing to do for the business. And the, the framework that I really used to, to think about this was, was the following. So what's the thing that helped you to be successful in the past? Can it help you to be successful in the future? Um, and uh, what had happened is that we'd built an excellent product, great velocity, great scale, but, it, but Zillow had also done the same thing. And our products were kind of identical. We were the green one, they were the blue one, literally. Um, the features that they had, they started in valuations, we started in homes for sale, and we added the same kind of features over time. So the products became identical, and what happened was that it evolved into a marketing battle. So collectively, we're spending $150 million on TV advertising, on Google, on Facebook, and everything over that period of time. It just become this sort of bloodbath in, in marketing where no one was winning. The second piece is like, is it possible to be number one? And Zillow had raised about three times the capital that we had, and had that gave them just one to two quarters greater scale to, than us. So we were, we were just tracking just behind them. And uh, if you know about marketplaces, network effects, if you're the number two, which we were at the time, it's just really hard to catch up. So it was not clear at that time how we could, in the, in the, in the near term at least, um, figure out how to be number one. Three is like a fair price for future execution. Um, you know, the, the numbers worked out that you know, we were doing quarter of a billion in revenue at the time. And so, and the transaction price kind of made sense. And then the last piece is, is sort of fatigue. Like, you just like burnt out. Um, I don't think I was. I don't think I was burnt out at the time, but if, you know, you often speak to founders that they just, you know, they're exhausted and that may make sense for them to do that. Um, but obviously, you know, that, you know the story. So we merged together in this multi-billion dollar transaction. Uh, I stayed on the board for uh, a couple of years, helping to manage the integration. And Zillow is, I think, now the largest residential uh, marketplace, residential real estate marketplace in the world, um, and has evolved over kind of many years. And uh, and then after uh, after combined the businesses, uh, obviously I stepped down and then started NFX with um, a couple of my friends over the years, James Courier and Gigi Levi Weiss. And as you guys know, today we uh, focus as a seed firm, so pre-seed and seed, focus on network of fit businesses, but also across many, many sectors from um, generative AI, fintech, uh, crypto, bio as well. And uh, open up to any questions.